I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, good morning and welcome to the Journey Church. We are already, because of that worship music, well on our way to having a wonderful, deep expression of worship before Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. If you are ever going to learn about God, there are four major ways that you're going to need to do it. Number one, read God's Word. Read God's Word. How can you come to know God without reading His Word? Number two, pray to God. Pray to God. And prayer is talking to God, sharing your heart with Him, and then listening to Him speak to you. Number three, go to church. Go to a church that teaches and preaches and lives out God's Word and shares the gospel. Number four, obey God. Obey God. The more a person loves and obeys God, the more they come to know Him and His love for them, and the more God will reveal Himself to them in His love for them. And concerning point number three, going to church, this is so very, very, very important. God tells us in his word that we are to be faithful in assembling ourselves together with others that know him, love him, worship him, obey him, and serve him. The Lord Jesus Christ teaches us through the author of Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, about how important going to church regularly is. And I quote, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We are not to forsake our own assembling together, meaning we are not to stop coming together to church as some people have the habit of doing. Some people have the bad habit of not coming to church regularly. Coming to church regularly is where we consistently learn how to study God's Word and how to pray deeply and how to love and care for other Christians and how we are to reach out to a lost and dying world. It's at church in worship that we deeply experience God. Amen? To encourage all four of these major areas in people's lives, that is why we are in a year-long sermon series. That said, on our next slide, you'll see the title of our sermon series, Christ, Christianity, and the Church. Christ, Christianity, and the Church. On our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title and passage, Sharing with the Poor and Needy in Church. Sharing with the poor and needy in church will be in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37, going through Acts 5, 1 through 11. If you will, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4 and turn to verse 32. If you did not bring a Bible with you this morning, we have the scripture up on the screens for you. On our next several slides, you will see our scripture passages. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37, and I'll be reading out of the NASB version. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds and the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each one as they had need. Now, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now we move into Acts 5, 1 through 11, also in the NASB version. But a man named Ananias, and with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and kept back some of the price for himself, with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit 
and to keep back some of the price of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over the, all who heard of these things. If you'll notice in verse 11, and great fear came over all the whole church and over all who heard of these things, we also saw that in verse 5. There was indeed a great fear that came upon people. On your next slide, you'll see a book entitled Fresh Power, and it's written by Pastor Jim Cimbala, pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. And uh, as I mentioned that each week in this Acts sermon series, I've been encouraging you, go pick up the book. You may go to normal mainline uh, bookstores, and it may be a little higher price, 15 to $20, but I'll guarantee you it is a wise investment for 15 to $20. But if you go to somewhere like Half Price Books, I have been hearing from some of you during the week that you found it for 5 or $6. In fact, one test testimony is of Terry who picked it up the one that shared the testimony with us this morning she went and picked it up after she watched the last two Acts sermon series and her words were I couldn't put it down I just couldn't put it down I finally had to stop I had other things to do but I couldn't put it down so why don't you get a good extra biblical resource that is a solid interpretation of the Holy Spirit's work in the New Testament church to go along with the study of these Acts series so study to show yourself approved on our next slide, you'll see two major focuses from our passage today. These are both extremely important. Number one, division. And number two, provision. And it means that there is to be no division in Christ's church. And there should be plenty of provision in Christ's church in order to meet the ministry needs in God's kingdom, especially those of the poor and needy. So I want you to keep these two truths in mind as we study God's word today. That said, let's take a little time and let's uh, dig into God's word and let's look at these passages that we've already read through once. We're going to go back and we're going to kind of break them down and let's talk about them. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Wouldn't that be great if you could go to church today and you found that as you walked day in and day out with that congregation that you were of one heart and of one mind and of one spirit? Wouldn't that be great? What do we find in a lot of churches today? Disunity, division, gossip, backbiting, arguing. That is not what was happening in the New Testament church in the first century when the Holy Spirit came in power at Pentecost and filled the apostles and filled the other people that were not apostles. As he was moving throughout his church, we find that that congregation of those who believed in Jesus Christ were of one heart and soul. But also we find out something different. There was a community of their hearts and souls and minds such a way that nothing was common property to them. In verse 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. Do you realize how important that is? Is that they kept in great power giving testimony that Jesus Christ was alive from the dead. Guys, I'm here to tell you, when you see somebody die, they stay dead. But they were in a generation where they said, no, we saw Jesus Christ alive on the third day. And they continued with great power giving that same testimony till they either died or were crucified, martyred, 
or until they thought Jesus came back. They just did that the rest of their life. They're just continued to talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When's the last time you looked at somebody and said, isn't it great that Jesus Christ is resurrected? Do you share that with people when they're talking about, oh, well, I'm Muslim, or I'm Hindu, or I'm Buddhist, or I'm atheist, or I'm agnostic? Do you ever get around to saying, but why not you believe in a God that's alive? And they'll say, what do you mean? Well, your God is dead. My God is alive. Over 500 people saw Jesus Christ alive after he was resurrected from the dead. Do you think you have any right to say that to somebody? Absolutely. It is in permanent earthly history. Why don't we share that? Wouldn't that be something if we were to think of sharing that fact the rest of this year through December, even more so than we want to share whatever score the Cowboys might have? A lot of us share a lot more worthless knowledge. Why don't we share knowledge about the fact that the God of the universe, the only God of the universe, is alive back from the dead? And it says abundant grace was upon them all. Why didn't it just say, and a grace was upon them all? Wouldn't that have been sufficient to say, and grace was upon them all? No, adjectives mean something. Abundant grace. Jesus used the word abundant back in John 10, 10, where he said the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, that Greek word is perissos, perissos. And it means superabundant, superior in quality, excessive, very high and beyond measure. Now think about that kind of grace that was being poured out daily upon all of the people that were believers in that church and that congregation. Think about this. Let's read it this way, being faithful to what that word means. And abundant grace was upon them all. Super abundant grace was upon them all. Superior grace was upon them all. Excessive grace was upon them all. Very high and beyond measure grace was upon them all. Do you need that kind of grace during your week? I need it in mind. Verse 34, for there was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each. Did you know that the Holy Spirit was moving so powerfully in the first generation when the Holy Spirit was filling the hearts of men and women and children that were believers in Jesus. They believed Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They didn't mind saying so. They kept giving great testimony about it. They actually were in community. They actually had one heart, one soul, one mind. They were actually not in division. And they actually said, hey, if I've got land, I'll sell it and there won't be a needy person in my church. You go, oh, well, I don't know if I'm going to be selling some things that I have in my personal property or portfolio in order to meet some needs of the people in my church. So these people would have land and go sell it, and there would not be a needy person in their congregation. And now verse 36, now Joseph, the Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means sons of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, you know what they were doing? They were selling off things that they had because they saw people within the congregation that believed in Jesus, and they said, we want to meet that need. So they went and sold houses and land, tracts of land, and they met the needs of the people. But by the way, they didn't just sell some land and this person see that person needing and go give it to them, and this person see that person needing and give them some, and that person saw that person needing and go give them some. No, they brought it to the spiritual leaders of the congregation and said, let them dispense it. This is their role. This is their calling from God. We don't know when and how to give somebody something. Did you know that if you go and just help people all the time, you might be causing them more problems by enabling them? Did you know the word of God also says, if you don't work, you don't eat? I don't want to teach something in the way that you get out of this passage. Well, hey, if I start going to church and I believe in Jesus, everybody's going to sell all the land and houses they got, and they're going to provide for me. That is not to take the grace of God biblically. That is an abuse of grace. That's laziness, and that's a leech off of God's church. But when there are true legitimate needs, the people around cared about the people that was in their congregation. But they didn't just dispense it because they said, we don't know how or when or what's the best time or about the amount to give to that person. So we're going to put it at the apostles' feet. Today we don't have the apostles, but we do have spiritual leaders. And you can bring it to the local church and they will dispense it out to those people that need it. 
in chapter 5, but a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. I loved how they taught us in seminary about the word but. It's a contrasting word. But here we have Joseph, who's also Barnabas, son of encouragement. This is the way Barnabas did it. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. Okay, this couple's evidently going to do it different than Barnabas did. So, But this husband and wife, they sold some property, but they didn't do the same thing. Verse 2, and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, he also laid what he brought at the apostles' feet and so did Barnabas. But something else is going on here. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? You might think that that is over with in the first century. But I'm here to tell you, Christians still lie to spiritual leaders in the church about what they're really doing in their life. I've had to call them on it. I, one man in particular I've known for 12 years. Oh, Pastor Bruce. You know, oh, Pastor Bruce. I'll never lie. Oh, I'm going to tell you the truth. I one day sat down with him at a local restaurant, looked him in the eye. Are you doing such a... No, no, Pastor Bruce, no. Are you sure? No, I'm absolutely sure. No, sir, I would not. I would tell you. From under the table, I put out an email and slid it to him. Right. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. You're right. Oh, yeah, I'm... Pat you, I, yes, I just lied to you. I'm so sorry. He could look me in the eye and lie to me. You know what Peter says here? You're not just lying to men. You're lying to God. We need to stamp out lying and deception in Christ's church. If you're not going to tell another believer in your congregation, in your church, the truth, keep your mouth shut. In this case, they would have still been living. The Holy Spirit actually took their life Peter says, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Meaning, if y'all had conspired together to keep back some and still be dishonest with us, you could have changed your mind because once you sold it, you could have said, well, honey, no, we did tell them we were going to give the whole price of the land, so let, let's just do the right thing. Let's be honest. Let's give the whole thing. They could have still redeemed that. It's at the moment that they brought it and lied to the Holy Spirit. That's when the sin occurred, and that's when they lost their life. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Did you know that before you can lie, you got to conceive the evil? you got to conceive it. Before you have actually lived out the lie, it's already started here before it's moved up to here. What's going on in your heart today, Christian? Is there something you're not wanting to be honest about? Is there something you're being deceptive about? Is it just kind of starting out here and it's incubating? And you're about to come out here with something that's a lie or deceitful? You better think twice. Think twice because from out of the man's heart is where evil comes. It starts here before it ever gets to here. But you can stop it. You can think and you can pray and say, God... I know. Do you think these people were convicted by the Holy Spirit before they actually lied to Peter and the Holy Spirit? Do you think they knew it was wrong before they did it? Oh, absolutely. The Holy Spirit had already convicted them it was wrong, but they pushed past that conviction. Have you ever pushed past the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life and you did it anyway? And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. You know, that's a little what we need in God's church today. A little fear of seeing God bring some righteous judgment. There's a lot of stuff that we're getting away with today. And you know what? The outside world is noticing it because they look at us and they say, you hypocrites. Why is the outside world not looking at us and go, you really holy people. You really righteous people. You bug me. You irritate me. Why aren't they saying that? Did you know back in the first century, they looked at him and said, oh no, Paul lives out what he says. Oh no, Peter lives out what he says. So much so, we're going to kill him for it. You know what we do today? Our walk doesn't match our talk, and so we don't have an effective witness, and people go, oh, you hypocrites. You wonder why Christianity is not going anywhere today? Because of us, Christian. 
Us, not the lost people, us. The young men got up and covered Ananias up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have come to bury your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over all the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Did you know that I do that as a pastor? Even in this day and age, I looked at my wife this week. I said, did you know that God always has a way of telling me what somebody's doing? Because as he set me here to lead, there are certain things that you are able to keep out of sight from me but I need to make righteous decisions because it affects your life and I have to answer for my decisions for you as a flock to God. But God always seems to help me know what's going on. The man I mentioned to you earlier that I took to the restaurant, his girlfriend sent me the email. I had no way of knowing he was lying. She sent me the email and said, he's lying. And by the way, same man, different girlfriend, it just happened all over again. There's times where I'll go to a husband, I'll say, hey, your wife told me she couldn't make it to church last week for such and such reason. Yep, that's it. I go talk to her and that wasn't the story at all. Isn't that amazing? People can just tell me husbands and wives conspire together is what they're going to tell the pastor. You need to realize that when you're talking to your spiritual leaders, those that are being led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's hearing what you're saying. It matters what you're saying to your spiritual leaders. On our next slide, you'll see a picture of a congregation. I want to read the slide to you. Come out here and talk to you for just a minute. Bring my Bible with me. There should be how much division in Christ church? No division. But plenty of provision in Christ church. So what causes division? Gossip, slander. In case you don't know what the word slander is, it's saying something that's not true about somebody. Gossip is saying something that's true. Did you know that so-and-so's doing so-and-so? Did you know that so-and-so's doing so-and-so? Can you believe that? That's gossip with flair. That's gossip, right? And we call those people that always want to start drama, right? You know any of those people? But slander is actually saying so-and-so did so-and-so and they did not do that. You're actually saying they did something they did not do. Talking bad about somebody. Have you ever talked down about somebody? Has somebody ever talked down about you? I can guarantee you as pastor it happens all the time toward me. People talk down about me all the time. But you know what I need to do? According to scripture, love them, let it go, give it to Christ, forgive them quickly, and keep praying for them and wish them God's best. That's what keeps me a freed up heart from all that stuff that happens. Judging, you've never judged anybody, right? Right? Judging, that's not supposed to happen in Christ's church. We read the New Testament letters and we wonder, boy, don't we wish Christ would move like that today? Don't we wish churches were like that today? Couldn't we see salvations like that today? If the church is not living according to Scripture and doing what Christ told the church to do, it's not going to bear fruit. Is that rocket science? Will our church grow if we stop gossiping, stop slandering, ta stop talking bad about people, and stop judging people? Do you think our church might grow? Praise the Lord, absolutely. Well, then we each need to stop robbing the Lord of his tithes and offerings. These gifts bless others in the congregation and the world. So we had two things going on in this passage. We don't need to be in division. We need to be of one heart, soul, and mind. We need to be of one spirit. We need to be together in unity and not in division. But then I want us to go over and uh, realize in our mind's eye what was going on. This was the first century. So all they had was Genesis through Malachi. They didn't have everything else. Jesus has taught, but yet they are just about to start writing the Gospels. Okay, so just remember, they didn't have the whole New Testament that we do. They had Genesis over to Malachi. So let's back up and let's look in the last book of the Bible that they had when the first century church was taking off. And we're going to go to Malachi chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 8 through 11. Will a man rob God? Now we've already found out this morning that men have no problem lying to God. 
But would a man go so far as to rob God? It's a big deal if you rob somebody, right? The police are going to come after you. They're going to arrest you. And they're going to take you to jail. And you're going to go to court. And you may go to prison. And there may be fines. Amen? It's a big deal to rob somebody because now the government's going to be after you. Well, did you know if you rob God, God's going to be after you? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me the whole nation of you. I get the impression in the 21st century that people in various Christian churches, regardless of denominations, don't really think twice about not tithing. Maybe feel a little twinge of guilt, wish I should. Wish I could. But really don't understand the implication of a holy God. Every little bit of income that comes into your home is from God. You may have said, well, I earned it or I inherited it. Every little bit of income that comes into your home is from God. And God is a great mathematician. And he says that 10% of that belongs to me. And you are not allowed to spend it on anything that's in your life. It does not belong to to you if you take it if you spend it you robbed me you didn't say you robbed the journey church he didn't say you robbed pastor bruce he said you robbed me so get that clear when you understand about the bible when it talks about tithes and offerings. you're robbing god every time you do not give 10 percent the whole time lest you think you're feeling good about yourself and you've been given eight percent lately you're still robbing god if I only had an affair on my wife with two women this year, I would say that's pretty good because it was 10 the year before. I'm getting better. I'm cutting it down. Wouldn't my wife be happy that I'm cutting it down? I'm getting more holy. She would say, you still got an issue. I mean, nobody. Don't have an affair with anybody. Your one love affair is me. That's faithfulness. God said, I don't want your nine and a half. I want the 10% I commanded. Now, he has not changed that in the New Testament. And by the way, once we see the Holy Spirit moving and abundant grace is falling upon the entire church, you know what they're doing? They're going way beyond the 10%. They're saying, I got land. I got tracts of land and houses. I'm selling that because there's needy people in the church. They've even gone past this. How many of you would sell a piece of land or a tract of land to make sure that there were people in your church family not going hungry or not being evicted? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Go now and look at what's happening in Acts 4 and 5. God wanted those needs to be met. Well, what was part of the process of the tithe and offering? Why do you bring the tithe and offering? Was God using it to build a heavenly condo? Or a heavenly yacht to go sailing? The monies that come into a church are used to provide for the people that need it in the church. You bring that whole tithe into the storehouse. Back then it was the temple. Now it's the local church. You bring the whole tithe into the local congregation so that there will be food in my house for people that need it. So maybe think about that. If you have no problems robbing God, think about the other consequence. There's people going hungry and being evicted because you're greedy. And I don't just want the whole 90%. I want a hundred percent. Now watch, God has an issue here. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this. God doesn't say test me anywhere else in scriptures. He says, don't test me. Here he goes, test me. Just test me. Says the Lord of hosts. And by the way, the, the, the Lord of the angelic host and if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. How big are the windows of heaven? Those are some pretty big windows here in our sanctuary. Those are floor-to-ceiling windows. Those are pretty big windows. I wouldn't want to have to pay for one to be replaced. But if you think about the ones in heaven, if God was to say, I will start to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing unto you until there's no more need. How big are the windows of heaven? Can you picture him opening that thing? Can you picture that? God saying, to you little believer... I'm just asking you to be faithful with the whole tithe. If you don't do that, I will curse you. 
Not my words. It's not Baptist theology. It's the Bible. I will curse you. But if you will be faithful, I will start to open up the windows of heaven and I will pour out a blessing for you until it overflows. Another version said, until there's no more need. Abundant grace will be poured out upon you if you will just be faithful. But you rob me and you take food out of the people that should have received it in the church recently. Our church has seen its finances do this. At one time, we had $93,000 in the bank. Over the last two years, we're down to about $38,000. From $93,000. But we have been giving. We have been faithful. We have been trying to do ministries. We have three parachurches and three overseas churches. We've not had to stop any of those, but we've had to cut them back. And recently, I just thought about it this past week. I know there's some people that are needing some help, and I'm about to have to tell them, can't do that. I'm so sorry. People aren't giving to their Lord. So you're going to have to find your help elsewhere. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. You know, there are pastors that every time they preach, they somehow find a way to bring money or tithing into every sermon. You ever been there? Ever heard that? You hardly ever hear me talk about it. I didn't just pick that topic today. We are walking through John and we're walking through Luke, uh, through Acts, which Luke wrote. I'm just at the point in the scriptures where it's mentioned. And I'm just being faithful to the text and where it is. We've all been burned by those TV evangelists. Now, not everybody that's on TV is bad. There's some great people out there, Charles Stanley and some others. There's some wonderful people, but some of them fleece the flock. Some of them send in your seed money and all of this kind of stuff, and we know that they're taking people for a ride. There are some preachers that do that. That is not what's happening today, and I'm not giving you some prosperity gospel. I'm telling you that God taught in Malachi, you are to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Then it was the temple. Today it's the local church, and you are still commanded to do that. And then we are seeing the abundance of grace poured out by the power of the Holy Spirit and people were feeling so convicted by the Holy Spirit. They were in unity, in mind and spirit. They were not lying to each other. They weren't lying to God. They were being a blessing to each other. They were selling their property and homes. And they were actually making sure the needs were met. And people were being saved and the church was going forward. And the darkness was being pushed back by the light of Christ. Is it just me? Or does anybody else hunger for that today? Or are you satisfied with the Christian ethic and the Christian worldview you have today? You're okay with that or do you sense something's not right? The more you and I do what the Bible says, the more we will receive what the Bible promises. Amen? I want to be a Christian that's either all in or all out. I'm from the country. And so I have little country sayings. I'm used to seeing properties butt up against each other and they're divided by a barbed wire fence. You can try to put your leg over in that pasture and you can put your leg over another side of that pasture because you want to live in both. The only thing that causes is for you to split your pants with barbed wire. Not pleasant. Get in that pasture or get in this pasture. Use another phrase. Cook or get out of the kitchen. Jesus wants faithful followers. Jesus was faithful to God and faithful to us even to the cross. Sadly, we can't even hardly be faithful to him to the convenience store. Dear God, help us. I've been asking you lately to pray each week. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. God, please fill me with the Holy Spirit. Have you been doing your homework? Or is this just what you do on the weekends, but yet during the week I've got work, I've got a husband, I've got a wife, I've got kids, I've got money, I've got bills, I've got a yard, I've got groceries, I've got shopping, I've got this, I've got doctor's visits, I've got maintenance on the car. I got... Do you not have time to call out to God every week? God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And you know what that's going to do? The more the Holy Spirit fills you, the more it's going to push out your selfishness. The more he fills you, 
the more the Holy Spirit will push out your selfishness. If you're okay with your selfishness and your sin, don't pray that prayer. But if you're saying, I'm tired of living in sin, I'm tired of living for me, I want to live for Jesus, and I want to see Christianity go forward. Guys, if the LGBT can go forward, and it is an evil agenda, not of Scripture, why cannot something holy like the Christian agenda go forward? It's because we, the ones that are the proponents of Christianity, are not doing it. Amen? Let's stand and let's worship Jesus Christ. Confess to him anything you need to confess today that's keeping you from being a sold-out believer. Get in one pasture or the other. Follow Christ or quit. Serve him or serve yourself. But do something. When you sing these words, remember, don't lie to the Holy Spirit. He knows if you intend to do this Monday. Be serious about the words or just sit there and hum. Don't sing words you don't mean. Lead us.